We're going to talk a little bit about um, hypnosis uh, and how can it be a useful adjunct to psychedelic therapy. Um, just to give you a little quick background of who I am, uh, my name is Niall Campbell. Uh, I um, previously was a dentist, uh, and um, yeah, most, that's the, usually the point most people leave the room. I had special interest in dentally anxious people. Um, does anyone here have issues at the dentist? Is not their favorite place to go? Yeah, so quite common. What I realized uh, the more that I got into it was that I was not treating dental anxiety per se. I was treating the manifestation of a more diffuse psychopathological condition that was just how it had manifest um, to me. Um, I, was, uh, I was unhappy with the treatments that were available for people to manage their anxiety. Most of them were pharmacological, just giving people sedation and then they never really got any better. They stayed as nervous as they had when they first came in. Uh, and so that uh, meant that I moved uh, more into uh, hypnosis uh, and found that to be very useful. Funny enough, I would help people with their, through imaginal exposure and hypnosis, I would help people with their dental anxiety and lo and behold, when they had moved past their specific phobia, they would say, I'm also X, Y, and Z. And I then set up a private psychotherapy practice off the back of that and retrained uh, in, um, in psychology. And it's been four years since I've uh, drilled a tooth, so which I'm very happy to say. <laughs> um, so um, you might be wondering why I'm standing here with a microphone. Um, I'm not about to burst into karaoke. Um, it would be uh, probably Backstreet Boys if I was, thanks for asking, but I'm, uh, I'm, I record a little podcast, and um, I, we have been interviewing quite a few people at uh, at the conference. Um, so we've been uh, we have a few episodes now. Um, we've interviewed uh, Amanda, Michael, uh, Martin Williams. Uh, if anyone uh, would be interested, that's the new work that's starting in Australia. Um, we've interviewed Ben uh, about his work um, with MDMA for for ostensibly for trauma, really, but he's obviously working with um, an addict um, population. Um, I will be taking questions at the end, obviously, but I appreciate there's a lot of content to get through. If you do have burning questions that I'm not able to get to, uh, please hit me up on these platforms. The best one is email. I'm pretty um, rubbish about getting back on social media. I don't really enjoy social media. Um, so the aim of the talk today is I just want to um, I just want to touch on the phenomenology and neurophysiology of hypnosis. Um, I also want to show how I suspect that it's overlapping with those of psychedelics. Um, and then what I really want to get down to is the brass tacks of how can we suggest possible clinical applications and just suggest a few potential lines for research. Many will be brain farts, but that's the way that science seems to work. We suggest things, we empirically test them, most don't work, some show promise, and then we double down on that. Um, I think there is a case to be made that hyp hypnosis might form a component of what I like to call the atelier. So an atelier is a basically like what fashion houses have. Givenchy had one, Alexander McQueen worked there. No idea was off the table, it was blue sky thinking. They, they threw out paradigms, they brought new things in. They, they used these you know, stage shows, the, the runway catwalk shows, um, to sort of advertise their thoughts. But by no means was that what actually happened on the, the high street. It was a disseminated and more parsimonious version of that. I believe that we're at the stage now where we need to make sure that we are giving everything a fair shakedown to see if we can optimally maximize the therapeutic container which we know needs to be there um, to support the psychedelic experience. And I think we've learned that sort of the hard way from a lot of the work in the 50s and the 60s. But the work of that they're doing at Imperial is fantastic. And I don't know about you, but I felt like we were really at a critical mass with that and it was very exciting to be uh, you know, alive in this time and work in this field in 2019. What I'm not intending to do is be a modality evangelist because that's something that I've seen whereby people will latch on to a particular way of doing things and then it's pretty much them until they retire. I'm not married to hypnosis. I'm not actually married to the idea of psychedelics. All I really want to do is see are there things which can help us to eat into the unnecessary quotient of psychological suffering which is just running rampant through the human condition. Not the Western world in my opinion, might be disproportionately so, but the human condition. And I say unnecessary because I think that suffering is a component of some of the most beautiful aspects of our life, but there's a big chunk of it which I think is unnecessary and we could, we could do away with. So these are our four topics for today. I am, I do speak quite quickly because I'm Irish. In my head I'm talking like this, but <laughs> if I am speaking too quickly or you need me to speak up, just let me know. 
So we're going to just touch on psychedelics, but I am by no means the best qualified person to talk about um, sort of mechanisms underlying that. But I do think it's important for us to just touch base with some of the new um, sort of hypotheses which are really gaining traction so that we can then potentially see those phenomenological overlaps. We're obviously going to talk about hypnosis. And really unbeknownst to me, there was preliminary work done in the 50s and the 60s um, sort of combining these two therapeutic treatments and uh, what a wonderful time I saw a lady uh, who was um, talking about cluster headaches and she put up a slide where they were able to give LSD to crickets. Oh, to be back in those days when the IRBs let you do stuff like that. So there was a little bit of literature about hypnosis and psychedelics uh, in a combined form. And then where I really want to get to is to just put some ideas out there for possible applications um, for, for future research. So first on to psychedelics. So obviously we have these sort of three main areas which were, um, you know, are really coming, sort of collapsing down onto seeing are being impactful for, for psychedelics. Um, Robert Carr Harris was at pains to say the other day that there was a nuance to the sort of impact on the, on the default node network. It was more the sort of alt disruption of the efficiency between the nodal communication as opposed to just some simple scale of it going up or down. Um, and I think more broadly we see that in the context of decreased integrity of resting state networks and then increased segregation within. So those are the sort of three um, sort of areas that, that we're, we're looking at um, conceptually at the minute. Um, I think one of the most important and seminal pieces of work, which was very, uh, very kindly open source, was that piece of work um, uh, by Carl Fristen and Robin Card Harris, you know, synthesizing um, the, the free energy principle and the entropic brain hypothesis. Um, and you know, as we've seen from the previous slide, a lot of these terms, which keep coming up again, the disruption of this, the desynchronization of, of that, um, they all collapse down onto that concept of, of, of entropy, so the hypothesis of the brain um, being entropic. Then when you superimpose this hypothesis um, onto the free energy principle, which is well beyond um, my intellectual capacity, but my understanding is that we, we, we basically are these biological you know, systems and we just seek to maintain order, which is analogous to saying that we're trying to reduce un uncertainty. And when you synthesize those two things together, you get this relaxed belief under psychedelics. Now, for me, clinically, what I found that that has looked like is relax, that's supposed to say relaxiomatics. People come in, and so what does this look like at a phenomenological level in the clinical setting? People come in with axioms, core beliefs. They're not, if someone's depressed, it has been my clinical experience that they're not depressively realistic. They're usually depressively delusional. And it has been of much more use to me in my work with addicted populations, not what substance they are addicted to, it's what core belief are they just incorrigibly hanging on to doing. The metaphor that I'd like to superimpose on top of that term is that if anyone has kids who like to play with Play-Doh, after a while Play-Doh gets chalky and the kids complain. To save the day you work water back into it but you can't just pour water onto it, you have to work the water in and then of course you capture some of that malleability but never all and then it ossifies again. That to me seems to be the, the way that I like to, I, I think I would conceptualize it to patients in the future. Basically, our minds go through these periods where we ossify, we hang on to these axioms, they totally dictate our behavioral uh, and, uh, sort of intonations, the way that we move through the world, and every now and again we need to have those axioms shaken up, and then there's a, a behavioral afterglow where we can really start to see if we can move them in positive directions. So in terms of hypnosis itself, um, what is it? Very simply, it's just a technique for the modulation of consciousness um, in which either a therapist or the experimenter uses predominantly verbal but occasionally more implicit suggestions um, to just modulate conscious states on the behalf of a participant. Another way to define it has been a motivated mode of neural functioning and that enables most humans to alter to varying degrees their experience of body, self, action and the world. Now, Whenever I have talked about hypnosis before in the past, a lot of times people have sort of said to me, oh, that's very woo-woo. I don't believe that you need to untether yourself from philosophical materialism at all to allow for this simple premise. And I'll just like to sort of demonstrate that to you now. You don't have to, but it is much more pleasant if you just simply close your eyes. You're all sitting here. Gravity hasn't really changed. But now, just through a simple suggestion, you become more aware of the weight of gravity on your legs from your hips all the way down to your feet. 
you're aware of your legs pressing into the chair in a way that you weren't before just right now. And I don't know if the right leg feels heavier than the left, and if I'm right, all that's left is for both legs to just feel as heavy as they were just before right now. And every word I say, they're getting heavier, and the heavier they get, the better they feel, and the better they feel, the heavier they get. You didn't realize perhaps how much tension you were holding in your body. We're all around each other. We just store a lot of tension in your body. So take a big deep breath in for me. And breathe in tension and relaxation and just breathe out all that anxiety. You don't really want it, you don't need it. And you're just back to full waking awareness. Nothing magical, but if we were to look in at some sort of imaging level, there might well have been some subtle changes in your conscious state of felt legs. Now, barring some massive change in gravitational force in the atmosphere, or barring some massive change in your, you know, functional sensoria, that was subtly mediated by nothing but verbal suggestions. In that way, I just see it as being like any other uh, mode of verbal suggestion, or verbal therapy, which can modulate the, the um, states of consciousness. And that's why I think it deserves a bit of a look at this atelier stage. Another thing that that will hopefully have shown is just that there's a bit more of a formal arc uh, that has been traditionally done. And I, I heard the last chap chatting about Milton Erickson, who was the father of, of more conversational style hypnosis. The evidence isn't really there that you desperately need um, a lot of um, formal and, you know, we're going deeper and all of this. You can just augment this perfectly easily in, in moments into more um, uh, sort of comprehensive uh, therapeutic modalities, in my opinion. So I started working in a very formal way and then I gradually started to move more towards you know their classics like ACT and CBT but once you've learned these techniques and as a dentist I was always finding that I was communicating in a hypnotic way and lo and behold my bills for local anesthetic administration went down because without knowing it I was modulating the amount of anesthetic that I needed to achieve the amount of anesthesia I needed in my clients. There's a normative distribution to this and it does seem to display trait like uh, stability. So we're looking at about 10 to 15% in this, um, you know, the more what we call high hypnotizables. I never use the word susceptibility and we'll come on to that. So these are the highly hypnotically suggestible people. And um, I'm just trying to get the exact name of this study. This is from um, a study done in Portugal um, where they, it nicely shows how the, 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 the tasks that they put the, the participants through you know, basically get increasingly more difficult and the, the altered states become increasingly more profound. So the highly hypnotizables over at this end, you're starting to see, um, uh, basically you can in, in, initiate or elucidate um, hallucinations. People can experience very profound states of, of anesthesia. And when you're working with them in a clinical population, and this is what piqued my interest, occasionally you will get the spontaneous reporting, the spontaneous occasioning of mystical experiences, which seem to correlate in my anecdotal experience with healing. Um, so it's just another little phenomenological overlap. Um, there isn't currently any um, real robust neurophysiological correlates for more generic hypnotic statements, but the hunt is on. And I think a lot of the work being done in psychedelics is going to start circling back and helping us um, in all of these different um, fields of altered states of consciousness. So we're sort of going to learn from the vanguard and, and that's why I'm interested in not neglecting these other um, more non-pharmacological ways to alter consciousness. So we've talked a little bit about how it's suggestibility, not susceptibility. Um, run your tongue along the roof of your mouth just here. There are people in this room, because just probabilistically, who, if we were to set up the protocol properly, could be hypnotized in such a way that we could extract your two front teeth and put loaded implants in with no anesthetic cover. And when I heard that, I thought this is absolute nonsense. Next week, I'm lecturing at a con uh, conference for dentists and dental anxiety management. I've seen people do this. It's insane. And that, I couldn't explain that outlier away. And that's what sort of piqued my interest in looking into this, because I, I want to see if we can jettison that type of profundity into the more effective disorders where psychedelics are going to go first, like depression and anxiety. Um, so just to cover this briefly, uh, Irving Kirsch would define hypnosis as a form of, I like this term, it's like non-deceptive placebo. But I don't think he meant that in a derisory way, because we all know how massively profound placebo um, effect can be. So in a way, it's actually a sort of ethical form of placebo because you're recruiting the patient's conscious mind 
um, Ted Kapchuk then defined uh, placebo as the biological response to caring, which I think is a lovely little phrase. It does a lot of heavy lifting um, because it allows for all these, you know, the, the weird and wonderful ways in which people will report that uh, sort of instances have healed them outside of a normal medical paradigm. So this explains, that phrase helps you explain why your hairdresser who takes good care of you can make you feel better sometimes than your psychologist. So those two things, when you collapse them down, what I think you get from a sort of definitional perspective is hypnosis functions as a type of overt suggestion, so that's the non-deceptive component, but it can be either implicit or explicit depending on the personality type of your patient, and you're giving them suggestions to heal. You're saying, why don't you heal? And then, in a materialist perspective, in ways that I don't understand, and I don't know if the whole body of science understands, you actually initiate biological cascades which result in exactly that, and people start to heal. And I think that hypnosis just functions as a way to consciously direct that placebo impact. impact. Um, so we'll just maybe briefly touch on the neurophysiology of this, but suffice to say, the two areas that it, it, it sort of collapses down onto are, we see a reduction in sort of metacognitive processing. Again, a phenomenological overlap with psychedelic experience because that ruminative self is lessened. Um, and then you get these, we've sort of alluded to some of the atypical connectivity of the um, executive control network. Now one thing that they do notice is that um, whenever it comes to actually experiences that you can elicit, you're getting these altered perceptual effects, but they do mirror our, what we the understandings that we have of the real thing. So for example, if you're initiating visual uh, hallucinations, you know, V4 will light up and things like that. So again, this hunt for correlates, more robust generic correlates is on from a neurophysiological perspective, but I think that work will, will, will um, unfold. Someone I'd really like to point to is Devin Terhern, who has spoken here. Um, his work has been fantastic um, on looking at uh, the sort of relaxing of mid-level priors from a temporal perspective. Uh, he's talked about that quite a bit and his, his work with Clement de Mercier is really excellent on this. If you want to deep dive into the, the overlap between the two, it's just really beyond the scope of today. So it can be used for pain, IBS, immunological enhancement all by itself. There's reported evidence of that, big studies on that, and those are no small things. If anyone has had chronic pain or if anyone has had IBS, they're, they're no joke but they're not exactly going to change the world. And the immunological enhancement, that's sort of difficult to parse, you know, what exactly is, is involved in that. Where it might be of most use, in my opinion, is as a bridesmaid. So it's going to be there to augment the modalities which are being created right now by Imperial. And I think that we might start to see that it could superimpose quite nicely um, in quick, scalable ways for the treatment of anxiety and depression. I've put a question mark beside this because I feel that Smoking cessation is a very useful uh, way that this can be employed and I'm very hopeful for the work with, um, that's coming out of Johns Hopkins um, through Matthew Johnson. The pilot work was amazing on the treatment of smoking cessation. They're all, there's a, there's a pre-existing pre culture of people who practice hypnosis treating smoking. Their success isn't amazing and it's, it's quasi-scientific, but whenever you look at what they're actually competing with pharmacologically, it's not like they're getting knocked out of the park by the substances that are on on uh, on um, sale at your you know at your pharmacist or th through prescription. And some of the side effects of those materials, like Champix, if anyone has taken that, I've dealt with quite a lot of fairly rampant side effects in people who have thought that I would rather smoke than feel this way. So there's a there's a potential overlap there. Um, so a little quick history of um, hypnedelics. Uh, I just, there's a wee bit of work on this, but I just want to pick out and just focus in on uh, a little story of two uh, real luminaries in the fields, in their respective fields, and then we'll look at one nice piece of research which was done in the 50s and I think is, is ripe for a bit of um, replication um, with our new standards and our new, new technology. So we all know and love this gentleman on the left. There's a very uh, youthful and sprightly Aldous Huxley, obviously the um, author of many seminal novels, including The Doors of Perception. What I wasn't aware of was that he had quite a profound and ongoing correspondence with Milton Erickson, who is widely considered to be the father of conversational um, hypnosis. Aldous was uh, fascinated by hypnosis per se. He, I forget the term he used, but he had his own specific term that he had organically arrived at. I think he would call it deep insight, or don't quote me on that, but it preceded every single bout, in his opinion, of really, truly creative work, so another area for exploration. He got in correspondence with uh, Milton Erickson and Milton found him to be a very highly 
hypnotizable, highly suggestible clients. So they, they sat down together and worked through um, some preliminary findings. Unfortunately, Aldous kept a lot of notes on this because Milton there was no slow coach in the brains department, but felt Aldous was the smarter of the two. His mind was bigger. He had phenomenal recall and he obviously was a master of the narrative arc. So they left all their combined notes in his house and then his house caught on fire and all that work was, was lost. But there's a nice report that Ericsson then sort of uh, patched together. Uh, and um, I'll just quickly read you this quote. Sorry, it's overlapping here. Huxley's remarkable development of a dissociated state, even bearing, even bearing in mind his original request for a permissive technique to view hypnotically his own growth and development. So there's that sort of internalizing model which we're seeing sort of organically emerge in distorted time relationships. There's the temporal distortion that you see clinically all the time when, while indicative of Huxley's all-encompassing intellectual curiosity. So sort of almost trying to delineate that from the fact that he was just the type of person who was curious and interested in things anyway. And just, I think that's almost like a little slight. He's like, he's just another client, you know. But um, He had a lot of respect for him, but he felt that this was suggestive of a most interesting and informative research possibilities. In my opinion, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, so I, I think this is worth looking at again. Um, so there was a study which was done by uh, Ludwig and Laverne in the late 50s, I think, and they took 70 uh, participants of um, high to medium to high hypnotizability. They randomized them, I'm, I'm pretty sure. There was obviously no blinding at that stage. That's an issue, ongoing issue. But they split them up into these five nice, sort of elegant little groups. Hypnodelics, so hypnosis plus LSD plus psychotherapy. Psychedelics, which they considered to be LSD plus psychotherapy. Just old delics on its own. They were just, you know, giving it to people and strapping them down and saying, see you in a few hours. Uh, hypnotherapy, which was, of course, psych this is the model I'm talking about. They didn't consider hypnotherapy to be this just, you know, rinky-dink thing that people did on the high street to make a few quid. It was psychotherapy augmented by hypnosis and then just psychotherapy on its own. They found uh, better clinical outcomes of sort of low, I think, st st statistical significance. You're always working with the sort of standards of, of, of the day. But I thought that that protocol is ripe for reinvestigation with today's, you know, imaging standards and um, it's just more rigorous sort of uh, protocols. So that's definitely something I'd like to see investigated in the future. So now we'll just get down to brass tacks. This is a little bit more speculative, um, and uh, some of these might not go anywhere at all. We're in this beautiful cross-pollinating world, and I've picked up so many things from people I would never have dreamed of going to see, and from speaking to some of the other people, that, that's been a fairly common experience. Um, so these are just some of the possible applications for, uh, for future research. One thing that gets talked a lot about is um, the prep of clients before um, therapy. But I think that it's very important to think about the practitioner prep. Sitting is not all that fun at times. It can be quite boring. But that's not to say that you shouldn't be present in the room. And I think we need to take care of the people who are actually sitting. And a nice little protocol of automated listening to a, a, hypno, a, a hypnotic induction, especially if you're highly suggestible, could very, very much center you to do the work that you need to do to, to be present in the room because um, I just think that's very, very important and in subtle ways you need to be there for, for the client. So then to get on to the, the sort of the, the, the meat of the sandwich, it's all about intention setting. But I'm always suspicious of intentions that were born out of a time whenever your ego was really, really on the go, okay? So it's a case of shit in, shit out sometimes, you know? It's like the protocol that you're bringing to the session is very important. I would want the least egoistically derived, uh, you know, uh, intention for the session. How can we make sure that it isn't contaminated by either the agenda of the therapist or the ego collapse um, of the actual client? So the, the ter term that I would use would be you want the intention to reveal itself, not to be engineered or revelation, not manipulation. You want it to arrive at as organically as you can possibly manage it. This little phrase, not my first rodeo, um, means that we're going to be dealing with a lot more people who have had not just no psychedelic experience, they might have had very little therapeutic experience. And I don't know, can we sort of manage that growth? This is a way I think it should be in a screening protocol whereby people who might be highly, highly hypn hypnotically suggestible, who could do just fine, with hypnosis can be sort of shunted away and say, you know what, we can use imaginal exposure and maybe augment it with this and, and maybe that will be enough for you. And even if not, even if it's like, look, we need to step you up to, to psychedelic therapy, when they get sort of into that internalized state, I think they're going to have some sort of 
antecedent compass to navigate their world. It, if you've only ever been with boring old, you know, ordinary consciousness or it's, it's sort of ugly bedfellow drunkenness, you could get lost quite, quite easily. Um, and as I said, I sort of shunt that. That concept that you should always run through is the, sort of the minim minimal effective dose. I would love if we could treat everybody with non-pharmacologically. You know, you just want the minimum effective dose. That just needs to be a default position, I think, as a, as a paradigm. And I think a marginal exposure might be enough. What I'd like to add on to the double S is a third S, to call it SSS. It will triple S, set, setting, and suggestion. A lot of the work they, with Ludwig and Levine, they said, we think people just went deeper into the experience because as the, as the psychedelics were coming on, their affective state and their whole physiology was just a better recipient of the, um, you know, than what we now know to be the 5-HD2A stimulation. So, um, uh, agonizing. So, so that's the one, one that I would look for. And then basically, you, I think we should screen for suggestibility. Torsten Passi, who I just interviewed today, said, we need to watch out for um, dissociative tendencies. And I suspect that fantasy proneness, you know, absorption might sort of have this sort of uh, collapsing capacity to pick out people who are highly hy hypnotically suggestible. And, you know, also those who might uh, be more prone to just mystical experiences organically. So I just think we need to screen for that from a therapeutic potential, but also from a relative contraindication perspective. And the screening for hypnosis might, might help. Um, moving into it, intra, um, you've all seen the, the movie Inception, I take it? Uh, just a quick funny story. My dad phoned me up said, I saw this brilliant movie Inception. I was like, oh yeah, dad, what do you think of it? And he said, uh, I fell asleep in the middle of it, so it's pretty meta, because he had a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream, but, so he, he was of no help for this particular slide. I like the term of a totem. You know, they all have a, a, a term that, that tells them when they're sort of back in their state. You need a small object, potentially heavy, something you can have on you at all times that nobody else knows. That's an elegant solution for keeping track of reality. Holotropic breathwork through the breath is eminently titratable. Breath work is obviously used a lot in hypnosis, but awareness of your body is eminently titratable. We can superimpose that on in ab reactions which are happening in tra trip. And I think the more experience people have of it not being their first rodeo, the more they can latch on to something. And you can work with clients to get them to surrender, to move where they need to move. And you're still containing trauma, you're just doing it in a more expansive and potentially healing way. Again, that concept of minimum effective dose. It could be a scope for um, augmenting a mini dose, you know, where I got the feeling that it was sort of the subperceptual doses aren't maybe producing the, the initial results that people are after, and they're sort of thinking, well, maybe there's a mini dose that, that works. Why not try and always be pushing this down with different combinations? So what about a mini dose with hypnosis that's regularly sort of beamed into your head through a, a playlist um, that we've been using, you know, Mendel Kalin's produced lovely playlists that have really, I think, deeply profoundly impacted the eff eff efficacy of the um, imperial work. Um, again, it's that possibility of I want the most titratable thing. And if anyone's experienced that of taking too much of something which they can't get out of their body, <laughs> you know, you, 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 you understand the importance of, of the ability to titrate. Last little area would be about post-trip application. Now, when you're in the afterglow period, I think that's super important. And then I, I don't get very woo-woo in that, that phase when I think about it. I'm looking at behavioral consolidation. I'm saying, okay, we've, we've come back with all these wonderful insights. Your marriage is in shambles. You're overweight, this, that, the other. Practical solutions to emotional problems is my first port of call. And I think that helping people to maintain that inertia there are many ways that hypnosis could help with that to orient people, to set the intention for the day. Um, I'm just seeing it superimpose on, onto that. Again, when I was listening to the, uh, the Rosalind Watts talk about this new protocol of, of ACE, which she's sort of uh, r rolling out and, and uh, explaining from all the qualitative analysis of the trip reports, it felt hypnotic to me. I don't know if this metaphor of diving down deep into to get the pearls, it, it had a hypnotic overlay for me. I'm obviously biased but it didn't seem like it was in a completely different wheel, wheelhouse. We get temporal distortion with psychedelics and we also get it quite reliably with hypnosis. But the beauty of a playlist is it timestamps the experience for you. And anyone who's worked hypnotically with clients will know that music has a big mediating effect as well. Um, another thing that often people 
seem to complain about when I'm reading, not complain about, but from trip reports, they're saying, you know, I, I just, I feel a bit more distant from that phenomenological afterglow. You know, I, just the feeling of being okay. The people that come back from intractable decades of depression and they've forgotten what it is to feel normal. I think touching base with that phenomenological reality a few months down the track just to steady the course is super important. When people come back, I think in the afterglow experience, there's a ly lyric from a James song that I like, if you haven't seen such riches, you can live with being poor. I want people to remember the wealth that they brought back with them. And I think hypnosis is a lot of little techniques whereby we will anchor experiences and we basically collapse down affective states. I've worked with athletes a lot. So for example, if someone feels very uh, not confident uh, in a particular sporting context or they get performance related anxiety, you can help them to feel affectively more calm and then you pretty much just sort of encode that through a physical action which they can then seek to, to re-enter that, that state. So I think that uh, access to the phenomenological reality shortly after a trip would be useful. I'm just going to put these slides up um, simply because they'll be recorded and there are people who are probably a lot well, definitely a lot smarter, more connected, more capable, more motivated than I am. These at this state constitute brain farts, but there might be something which comes out of it. Does the afterglow microdosing effect uh, um, affect hypnotic suggest suggestibility? So is there a bidirectional focus on this? And I think Devin's looking, going to be looking increasingly closer at that. You know, does microdosing, is the trait like stability of hypnosis that we've been recording, is the sort of heritability of it, is that true or is that just because you don't really, haven't really looked at it properly? Um, the triple S protocol, I'd like to see if there are, you could split up protocols and say, did the people who were, you know, explicitly given suggestions, was their trip more profound? What was the noetic sense like? What was the afterglow effect like? There's a, there's a battery of tests you could, you could compare. I'm very keen on the relationship with suggestion and music. And Rebu, just <laughs> totally stealing that term, relaxed, um, relaxed beliefs under hypnosis. Um, are there discrete and predictive coding correlates of hypnotic suggestibility? That's you know, an ongoing question. And um, can these specific neurophysiological signatures be elicited with specific hypnotic suggestions? Uh, I'm just going to put that up there, have a quick photo snap if you want, because I'm conscious of time. Um, but I'm very interested in psychosomatic work as well. I think that's, that's an area that needs um, big exploration. Um, and <laughs> I don't know if you all remember uh, uh, Alan Partridge. There's a scene where he has done atrociously at his television program. He's with the BBC commissioning editor. He's not going to get a second series. And he's just pumping out stupid ideas after the next. And the, the commissioner's just shutting him down. I feel at the minute we're all like Alan. At one point, he just, he just runs scraping the barrel. And he, he suggests a television program called Monkey Tennis, or a program that I would actually have liked to see called Youth Hosteling with, with Chris Eubank. And of course, the BBC commissioning editor just says, absolutely not. But in a way, I think when we're dealing with these noetic, uh, expansive states, we do need to proceed with a certain amount of humility and realize that regardless of the credentials after our name, regardless of our clinical background, we are all Allens and we're just scratching at the surface. So thanks for coming along to the talk. I hope you had a good breaking convention and aha. Uh -huh. <laughs>